Good afternoon. Consultants and junior doctors have walked out once again in their dispute with the government over pay and staffing. This time, the joint strike by members of the British Medical Association will last three days. Patients are powerless, hospitals have barely recovered from the last strike, and there are reports some doctors are being paid more than £7,000 a shift to provide cover. The dispute in England has already seen a million appointments postponed and it's more than 100 days since the health secretary met BMA leaders to discuss the deadlock. Graham Stothard has the latest. It's gorgeous. It's the beginning of a new adventure, one of the happiest days of a family's life. But with warnings of extreme disruption due to strike action, hardly a reassuring time for new and soon-to-be mums. Here on the maternity ward at Whips Cross Hospital, some caesarean sections have been delayed. Other hospitals have taken similar measures. We have seen a lot of disruptions in elective care that we provide, so our elective caesarean sections. So if somebody has made a choice and they have decided they're going to have their baby on a specific day and that um, caesarean section is rescheduled, then it is a worry because they also have planned and they're looking forward to seeing their baby. Maternity is, of course, not the only service affected. For all of us, we're hoping that this strike action will come to as swift an end as possible. That's a matter for the trade unions and the government to resolve. But there's no doubt that for our staff and for our patients, if we can minimise the impact of strike action, I think that's best for all concerned. Junior doctors first went on strike in March, consultants in July. Their first joint action was last month. That saw almost 130,000 appointments rescheduled bringing the total number since the strikes began to more than a million, further adding to hospital treatment waiting lists that now stretch to almost 8 million. One, two, three, four. Junior doctors were looking for a 35% pay increase. They've been offered, on average, 8.8%. Consultants are thought to be after 12%. They've been given six. Both say their demands for more are to make up for years of below inflation pay rises. We're facing a huge erosion in our pay and without restoring this pay what's going to happen is more and more doctors will leave this country, they'll go to other places like Australia, Canada, New Zealand where they're being fairly remunerated and what that will mean is the waiting list here will just continue rising and rising um, and patients will receive poorer care as a result. The government says a fair offer has been made. Chancellor Jeremy Hunt saying the decision to strike is completely unacceptable. During the strikes, the BMA have promised emergency care will be staffed, but with minimal cover elsewhere, what they call Christmas Day levels of staffing. A reminder that as we head into winter, always a challenging season for the NHS, it may be more challenging than ever. Graham Stothard, ITV News. Let's join our health correspondent, Martin Stew, who is at the Royal Berkshire Hospital in Reading. Martin, how has it been there so far today? Well, Nina, fewer staff than normal, but to be honest, they're coping because they have to and they're really well practiced. We've had lots of strikes now. The real issues, though, as Graham alluded to in his report, are what are bubbling behind the scenes. So more than a million outpatient appointments have been cancelled. That's a conservative estimate. Just here, we think it's about 6,000. Speaking to the team, you have to make those phone calls and tell patients maybe the sixth or seventh time their appointment has been cancelled again. It's demoralising. Appointments now being booked into 2024. Plus, you've got the financial burden, the financial cost. Bringing in locum staff is expensive. It's cost this hospital trust £1.1 £1 .1 million. Across the whole of the NHS, it's estimated these strikes have cost around a billion pounds. But in context, that's about the same amount that the junior doctors wanted for a year's extra salary. So something has got to give. Yeah, but there's no resolution in sight, is there? So are there more strikes to come? Well, there are no official strike dates yet, but speaking to the BMA, the union, this morning, uh, they say that it is likely we are going to see more. And that is particularly problematic as we are heading into winter. Look, if we look over to Australia, they've just had a relatively severe and early flu season. We often have something similar in this country, and we know the NHS is under greater pressure over the winter. If we see those pressures combined with strikes, it could be a really challenging few months ahead. Martin Stew, thank you. The big clean-up of our rivers and oceans of the sewage which has been flowing into them could, it seems, be paid for by us, the customers of the companies. 
The water companies want bills to increase by £156 a year by 2030 to pay for upgrades. The industry body says that would allow infrastructure spending to almost double, funding the construction of 10 new reservoirs. And the money, they say, could prevent 140,000 sewage spills into our waterways. That is the equivalent of 6,800 Olympic swimming pools. Chloe Keedy has been looking into this uh, development. What's uh, the reaction been? Well, Nina, I can't imagine anyone being thrilled at the idea that yet another bill might be going up. The idea is that they'll increase gradually, so over a five-year period. So we'll pay on average £7 a month more in 2025, and then by 2030, that'll rise to £13 a month more. The water companies say it's essential to ensure the security of our water supply in the future. They're calling it the most ambitious modernisation of sewers since the Victorian era. And they're also saying it'll create thousands of jobs. But critics say it shouldn't be customers having to foot the bill for this. They say that water companies have failed for decades to properly invest the money that we already pay them on our bills each month. Water UK, the body that represents those water companies, refutes that. It has been defending its investment record. And the boss of one of those companies, uh, York, Water spoke to us this afternoon and she said they don't have a choice about making these investments in the future. They simply have to be done. In Yorkshire Water's case, that's £7.2 billion of expenditure. And we're going to make sure that we use as much as possible to improve the environment, make sure we do things that customers have told us they want, making sure we continue to invest for flooding resilience in Hull, that we continue to invest for our bathing waters. So you can see the volume of work that has to be done to meet those needs. The final decision will come from the watchdog off what? Yeah, that's correct. It now has to scrutinise those proposals and decide whether it thinks the increase is justified and whether it thinks that the increase will deliver significant improvements. But off what itself has, has faced questions about its ability to effectively regulate uh, the sector. So look, the Prime Minister was asked what he thought about all of this today. He said he'd be following the process closely, but that it is now up to off what to ensure that it's not customers who are paying the price for poor performance. Chloe Keedy, thank you. The football fan who mocked the death of a young supporter at a game has pleaded guilty to a public order offence and could face jail. The judge told Dale Houghton his behaviour was utterly deplorable after he taunted Sunderland fans with an image of Bradley Lowry, who was a mascot for the club, before he died from a rare cancer in 2017. Houghton's actions caused anger and shock in the stadium and beyond and led to a surge in donations to the charity set up in Bradley's name. Houghton will be sentenced in November. Conservatives are in Manchester this week for what could be their final party conference before the next election. In the past few weeks, we've reported on infighting within the party over climate change and the high-speed rail link HS2. But today's row is about taxes to cut or not to cut. That is the issue and not all Tories agree. So can the former Prime Minister Liz Truss persuade the current Chancellor to change his mind on not reducing taxes this year? That's what party members have been queuing up to hear our political correspondent, Carl Dinan, was watching. The Chancellor visited a vast new arena being built in Manchester this morning as he and the Prime Minister tried to rebuild support for the Conservatives. He had a couple of announcements, a thousand pound increase in the national living wage and a slightly vague promise to get tough on benefits claimants who don't look for work. But he also said this was not the right time for tax cuts. If we had tax cuts now, it would be inflationary. And the biggest way that we can help ordinary families is to bring down the rate of inflation. If we halve inflation, that's a 5p boost to people's incomes compared to if we didn't do that. So that has to be our focus. Many Tories would like tax cuts, but one Tory in particular was leading the call today. Yes, she's back. Are you just here to cause trouble? And she is still a big draw. Conservative members queuing up all the way through the conference hotel to hear her speak. Twelve months after reversing a tax cut in the middle of a Tory conference, Liz Truss is here calling for a new tax cut. We need businesses to be able to expand, to grow, to create new jobs, to create new ideas. That's why I'm calling upon the Chancellor at the autumn statement to put corporation back tax back down to 19%. And frankly, if we can get it lower, the better. 
But even her closest ally in government wasn't prepared to back that call publicly. Would you like to see tax cuts anytime soon or, or would they be inflationary, as the Chancellor says? It's a matter for the Chancellor. And not everyone is pleased to see her. Should Liz Truss have stayed at home? Yes. Why? Uh, I think she was a poor leader of the party. United parties win election. Yes. Get on board or get out. I think she's come here to say something. I think people should listen. The Chancellor will make his speech here this afternoon, but it's already clear he won't be taking the advice of his old boss. Carl in ITV News, Manchester. Just one of the other big issues for the Conservatives is the future of the high-speed rail link, HS2. Could the new line really stop at Birmingham? Our political editor, Robert Peston, is at the conference and has been trying to find out. Uh, Robert, what have you found out? So, look, I've got some important breaking news in just the last hour. I've been told by a very, uh, shall we say, well-connected, informed source that the Prime Minister has now taken the decision to shelve the leg that goes from Birmingham to Manchester. Uh, he's received uh, a proposal from the Treasury. Treasury deeply alarmed by the cost overruns on HS2, as I think you're aware. Uh, the cost was originally, or the budget was originally set at a little bit less than 40 billion. It's now soared to well over 100 billion. The Treasury not convinced that they can be brought under control. Uh, it has given a recommendation to Downing Street about what the savings from cancelling the Birmingham to Manchester link can be spent on. Uh, they run to many, many billions, and that the package that they presented to the Chancellor is for much better east to west rail links within the north of England and much more money spent on other road and transport schemes within the north of England. Um, so, as I said, the, the, the Prime Minister has been considering this and I have been told he has now made the decision to shelve and many people will just see that as a sort of euphemism for cancel, scrap that leg from Birmingham to Manchester. I, I've been speaking here to politicians uh, with a huge stake uh, in HS2. Saw so Andy Street, uh, the mayor of the West Midlands, Birmingham, uh, both today and yesterday, deeply troubled by the cancellation of that leg. The Prime Minister's view, however, is that this is one of his long-term decisions, that although this will upset some very powerful people, may even upset some international investors. He thinks he can make the case for why this is the kind of sensible reallocation of money at a time when funds are scarce. OK, Robert Peston, thank you very much. And we will, of course, get uh, much more reaction to that uh, breaking story on HS2 there as the day goes on. Still ahead this lunchtime, checking out the boss of John Lewis calls it a day and... Welcome to New York. The star who does have the Midas touch, American football's newest cheerleader. First, do you think mobile phones are a distraction and lead to disruptive behaviour and bullying in schools? That's what the Education Secretary is expected to tell the Conservative Party conference later as she calls for a ban on phones at schools. The problem is the unions say such a ban is unenforceable, while others argue that many schools have already told pupils the use of phones within the school day is not allowed. This lunchtime, Downing Street said the government could eventually make a ban the law. Our political correspondent one and Harry Horton is at a school in Oldham this lunchtime. Harry, too little, too late. What's the reaction to this where you are? Well, it's the lunch break here at this school in Oldham and no mobile phones on show here. The policy at this school is that mobile phones are to be switched off, kept in your bag or locker. If uh, a teacher sees a pupil with a mobile phone, it will be confiscated until the end of the day. And it's similar policies uh, across the UK at the moment. So schools are able to issue their own rules uh, on these sort of things. But in England, they're expecting the guidance to change. And the Education Secretary is expected to confirm this afternoon uh, that guidance uh, will be for mobile phones to be banned in classes and during breaks across schools 
in England. There's been concern among some teaching unions about how this might be enforced, about opposition from parents potentially. Uh, there are bans on mobile phones in schools at other European countries and uh, earlier this year the United Nations put out a report uh, highlighting that proximity to mobile phones uh, will cause distraction for students uh, and has a possible negative impact on learning uh, as well. The head teacher at this school here has said that this announcement is farcical. He says that the Education Secretary should be focusing on far bigger issues like the Iraq concrete crisis, recruitment or mental health among pupils. Harry Horton, thank you. The boss of John Lewis is quitting her role. Dame Sharon White is to step down at the end of her five-year term, the shortest serving chair in the store's 100-year history. She joined the business just before the pandemic, but has overseen huge losses, which led to the annual staff bonus being scrapped in the last financial year. Our business editor, Joel Hills, is outside Peter Jones and Partners in Sloan Square in central London. Joel, is this announcement a surprise? Well, I'm surprised. Uh, three weeks ago, I was in the store behind me interviewing Sharon White when the partnership uh, reported its half-year results. The business made a loss, and Sharon White was saying then that it would probably take until 2027 at the very earliest before we saw a sustainable revival of the company's fortunes. But she was signalling at the time that she and the rest of the leadership team intended to be around to see the job through. So I think, it, on the face of it, looks as if things have changed. Now, in the email that was sent to staff at the partnership this morning, remember it's employee-owned, this is being presented as an orderly, inevitable transition, a changing of the guard. It was pointed out that she always agreed to a five-year term in February 2020. She's going to see that term all the way through. She retains the confidence of the board and it was her decision to stand down eventually. But there is a but. The turnaround is very clearly not complete. And I think you have to look at the fact that this news leaked as indicative of tensions within the organisation. In the last few years, Sharon White has made a series of really radical decisions, which she has argued were absolutely essential if the partnership were to survive and to thrive. They have been unpopular. I'm thinking of decisions like suspending the bonus, like building homes uh, to rent, and she has run up against opposition. One idea she was considering of selling a minority stake in the partnership ended up being shelved because she ran into resistance. And I've learned that earlier this summer, the partnership board, who she resigned to today, in effect, blocks voted down a plan to sell the partnership's Leckford estate in Hampshire in the hope of raising almost £100 million. What we don't know, of course, is how much this resistance contributed to her decision. Joel Hills, thank you. Finally this lunchtime, how Taylor Swift is leading to a surge in ticket sales, but not at her own gigs. Once again, she's been spotted at a big American football game after rumours of a starting a new love story with a star NFL player. Q, a boost in spectator numbers, TV viewers and merchandise sales, including a rise in the number of women watching. Sally Biddle from The Swift Effect on Sport. Sunday Night Football. Taylor is in the house. Hi, Swifties. We'll be with you all night. <laughs> As celebrity rumours go, it doesn't get much bigger than this. A two-time Super Bowl champion dating the biggest pop star on the planet. Taylor Swift now spotted at two games to watch her reported new boyfriend, the Kansas City Chiefs tight end Travis Kelsey. A cheeky grin from him on his podcast, all but confirming they're a couple. Shout out to Taylor for coming through and seeing me rock the stage. Last night, it was New Jersey's MetLife Stadium where Taylor was seen drinking and cheering from the stands with her arm around Travis's mum. Donna Kelty's living the best life of all. Taylor fans are, well, fanatical and are now diving headlong into football in their thousands. I'm an even bigger football fan now because of Taylor Swift. I think it's crazy. I mean, I think it's great, you know, but I do think it's nuts that how, how all of a sudden everything's skyrocketing because of Swift. And that Swift effect is spreading. Ticket sales surged for last night's game and Kelsey picked up 900,000 more Instagram followers last week while sales of his player's jersey increased by 400%. But football, it seems, is the biggest winner. 
is a great opportunity for the NFL to bring in not only a new demographic of younger women who may have felt excluded from the game before, and also a new psychographic of people who are just looking for fun and entertainment. Taylor is no stranger to NFL stadiums, performing in 20 of them this year on her sellout tour. But even as a spectator, she's still the headline act. Sally Bidolf, ITV News. That's it this lunchtime. Mary's here with the latest on the evening news at 6.30. From everyone here for now, bye-bye.